There's dancing. Everyone loves to dance. There's dances with fantastic rhythms. There's all kinds of energies, many different movements. In fact, some places, if you go and you say, what is dancing, people will say, oh, dancing, and they'll start moving their feet. But other places, if you say, dancing, they'll say, oh, dancing, move their arms. Some places, if you say, dancing, oh, dancing, and then eyes, head, neck will move. So it means a lot of things, and there are a lot of varieties. But one of the things that I really love about the traditional dances here in India is that the dancer gets to be an actor. And this is something that's pretty rare. Now, there are a lot of beautiful movements. There are the rhythms. But the dancer gets to tell stories. And this is actually a tradition that goes back a couple thousand years. There's a book, the Natya Shastra, that, that talks about this. But the very uniquest thing, the most special thing that is hardly found in other kinds of dances around the world is that the dances in India evolved out of a spiritual consciousness. Now, what that means is, that the dances might be entertaining, we hope you enjoy them, but that's not the limit of their aim. The aim of the dance is much higher. The aim is transformational. The aim is that when you see a performance, you are going to come out slightly different, on a slightly higher level. So when I'm talking to you, I'm communicating left brain, but when I'm dancing, I want to touch your heart and your mind with the right side of the brain. Now, when I started this greeting to the earth, we all know there's Mother Earth. We all respect the earth. But this frames our presentation. It says, before I begin, I'm acknowledging the earth is supporting me. I'm saying thank you. And forgive me if I make a misstep. So it's a little bit of a formal ritual part of the story to allow the artist to remember that we have to respect things. You have that. I mean, musicians respect their instruments. Painters respect their brushes. But here we have an actual ritual to be sure that we do this. And then, where the hand goes, it's written, the eye goes. Where the eye goes, the mind follows. Where the mind goes, the emotion goes. And then when you have emotion, you have the essence, the rasa, the juice, the real essential thing that comes out of it. Something about that ultimate unknown reality that everyone shares. That's why when we talk about stories, it doesn't matter whether it's a story of today or ancient times, because they all are about a shared reality. To transform the viewer, to give you an experience of something that is really beautiful, but not in just a, a saccharine, artificial, sweet way, something that is giving you an experience of love, but not sappy and not like um, in a very limited way or a selfish way, but a love that embodies something greater than self, a higher self, something that includes compassion, includes all of humanity and nature. To be able to give an experience of truth, that truth that is divine, it's not religious, it's not about any particular form or belief, but something that when we do the specific of a story or the name of a god or goddess, it doesn't matter because that's not what it's about. It's about something beyond that, 
which we all share and is beyond our understanding. Now, right now, I'm standing here live in person. I'm talking to you, I'm going to be dancing for you. I see you. You see me. Live performance. We are co-creators. This is happening right now. It will never be recreated. And it's something that is created by us absolutely together. Now, in India, there's an expression called darshan. It can happen in a temple. It can happen out in nature, looking at a sunset. But when you experience something that is divine, you have darshan, that sense of seeing and being seen. And so as a performing artist, to be able to attempt, I mean, it's a very big goal. Obviously, I don't think that it, I can always achieve it. But if you don't aim for something, you can't get it. And so aiming, trying to do something that is going to give you an experience of something that is really sublime is such a thrilling thing as a communicator, as an artist, as a human being, that it's such a thrill that actually when I came to India and I thought that I would be here for nine months and then I would go back, I had an offer from Jim Henson to join the Muppets and all my friends were in New York and dance companies. But then I thought if I stay a little longer and a little longer, sort of going to that horizon, and the thrill of being able to perform in villages, in temples, for students, for people who were Sanskrit scholars, for people all over the world. I said, this is something that I really, really want to do. I can always go back, teach, write. That's wonderful and important. But wow, to actually be able to do it, to really take the tradition forward and move people. I said, this is. This is something that as long as I'm able to try to do it, as long as I'm welcome, I'm going to keep doing this. And so far, I'm still here. I don't, I don't know about the future. Now, one thing about these stories, if you have a picture in your wallet or that you keep with you, somebody you care about, you obviously don't think that picture is the person. But when you look at that picture, why do you have it? You have that picture, it makes you think of them. It gives you a focus. You might even speak to the picture. Well, in India, all the Hindu gods and goddesses are like this. Nobody thinks that they are actually the person or that, that mythological being. They're metaphors. They're allegories. They are what allow you to understand that quality and focus on it. Shiva is a god in India, and one of his main features is the fact that he dissolves the universe when a cycle has ended. Modern physicists, when they want to describe the Big Bang Theory in a more poetic way, they call it the dance of Shiva as he stands there dancing on the dwarf of ignorance. Now, if a mother wanted to tell her child about Shiva, and the child said, Ma, how big is he? Is he as big as Daddy? And then the mother says, No, no, sweetheart, he's much bigger. And then the child says, Well, is he as big as the house? No, no, he's bigger than that. Shiva is so huge that the moon is an ornament in his hair. So this image of the moon is a way of showing size, because we all know how hard it is to imagine huge numbers. What's a million? What's a trillion? How big is something? So an illusion like this, the moon as an ornament in his hair, is a way of giving that sense of vastness. Now, here I am in a costume. And you'd think for telling a story, I don't really need it. But in Indian dance, in classical dance, this is actually an Odissi dance costume, your appearance is part of the expression, along with the text, the words, the poetry, along with my facial expression, my eyes, my hands. 
And even the costume, it's supposed to be beautiful because the dancer should be like a heavenly dancer, an apsara, who's come down to earth in order to dance and tell these stories. So my eyes are elongated like a fish. My eyebrow should be like Cupid's bow. I have the sun and the moon on my forehead. This is like the tower of a temple. And in any case, all of the ornaments, everything, is to give the appearance of a heavenly being as part of this. Now, we heard earlier, and everybody knows about the gods of Greek and Rome, but these gods, which inform our own sense of identity and mythology, are no longer prominent. Thor, king of the heavens in Norse uh, mythology. Um, Zeus, Greek god of the heavens. No one is actually going out and showing respect to them anymore, except for fun. But in India, Indra, the king of the heavens, didn't get kicked out when the universal gods came in. He simply got demoted. So here's a little story that's used to explain it. Now, most of you are familiar with Krishna, the flute player. He grew up in a village of cow herders, but he was actually a prince. So instead of a crown, he wore a peacock feather. However, Hindus believe that he's really a form of Vishnu, who is the preserver of the earth. So when little Krishna, playing his flute, saw that all of the people had gathered together in the village of Braj, where he was staying, and they were going and offering flowers and incense and all kinds of things up to the heavens where Indra sat in Indralok. He said, why, why are you going and worshiping Indra? They said, oh, we're very much afraid. If we don't, he'll send down thunder and lightning and hailstones. Well, he said, you know, really, you should really show respect to the mountain, Govardhana, which has all of the grass. And you should offer thanks, and this should be out of love and not out of fear. Well, if you're Krishna and you're actually the preserver of the universe, you're quite convincing. So all of the people came. They went to the mountain. They made their offerings to the mountain. Meanwhile, up there in Indralog, Indra is very angry. There's no offerings. He doesn't smell anything. He doesn't know what's going on. He looks down. He sees this whippersnapper kid and, uh, uh, and he says, this is the nonsense. He sends down, of course, thunder and lightning. Now, you see, Indra is the king of the heavens, but that is just that little spot above our air, above our atmosphere. He's a nature god. It's part of our earth, our nature, our solar system, sun, moon, water, fire. But he doesn't have a universal vision, so he can't figure out who Krishna is. And so he, um, he comes all the way down to earth, but as he approaches, now, when the people, of course, were frightened, what did Krishna do? He went and he took the mountain, picked the whole thing up, put it on his little finger. It made a giant umbrella, and everyone came underneath. So now, when Indra comes, he gets closer, and he sees that actually this, this little boy is the embodiment, the preserver of the entire universe. So he bows down to him. So this story in dance, in paintings, in legend, is just a way of showing how the nature gods are respected but less important. You still have in villages, people will go out and they'll offer water to the sun every morning. It doesn't mean that the sun is, is the most important god. But in India, you get such a variety because they all are metaphors for different things. Now, you see that I'm using all of these hand gestures. And um, you, sometimes they're clear and sometimes they're not. We have, depending on the dance style, there could be 26, 27, 28 single hand gestures things like this, 
uh, three parts of a flag. There's quite a variety, the eye of a swan, the wing of a swan, and they have various meanings. But it depends on how they're used. So if I have this, which means pataka, means a flag, well, if I'm showing Indra and it's over my head, then it's definitely a flag. But if I do this, you don't need to know Indian dance or Sanskrit to know that that is, um, that's me, that's me. Or here, putting on oil. And here, what do you think this is? It's a mirror. If I use my hands this way, this way, it's going to be water. But if it's from up here, it's wind. I can use it opening a window or opening the door. So depending on the usage of the hand, it becomes like alphabet letters. And I can use that alphabet, combine it with words, combine it then with phrases, and it has a lot of meanings. Of course, there's also double hand gestures because one flag put together with another creates Anjali or Namaskar. And if I want a bird, if I want to show Shiva, if I want to show a bed, it takes two hands. But the hands by themselves aren't the meaning. If, if this hand is a tortoise, it doesn't actually communicate a tortoise. It has to be a combination of the hands the movement, the expression, and the text. So all of them combine together to create that meaning. And it's also considered a higher art when the dancer can tell the whole story. One person, no props, no scenery. I mean, it's nice to have dramas, but that's different. Here, the idea of smelling a flower, which is frankly very hokey in like some traditions. To, but here, it's like if you can in, invoke that, that really is a fine art. Or if I can create the sense of a character and another character, that one person doing it is a much greater art. Now, another thing that's quite unique, well, unique in the sense, unique it's in Asia, but not so much in the West, is an attitude toward love. In Indian philosophy, and then in the dance that expresses it, human love is considered as close as we humans can get to try to see what it is to love divinely. Human love, divine love, spiritual love. And so there are so many dances that are about a heroine and yearning for uh, a beloved, preparing to go and meet him, and all of those anticipations. Not much of meeting, but more of the idea of yearning. And this is because the heroine actually stands for the human soul. And that soul is seeking, yearning, wanting to join with that higher self, that spiritual reality, which is represented by some divine being. So sometimes people say, aren't these dances kind of retrograde? You've always got this female, and she's yearning for this guy, and she's waiting for him, and he's not there, and, uh, and she's pining. Well, that would definitely be true if it was about a human being. But it's not. It's totally a metaphor. So um, one little chunk from a dance that was written by a poet, Jayadev, in the 11th century, is about the story of Radha and Krishna. And so here, Radha is the heroine. She's very beautiful and very fine. And she says to her girlfriend, the Saki, now the hand is hamsapaksha. That is usually used for a girl. Sometimes this, sometimes this. So she says to her girlfriend, oh, Saki, Please, I'm asking you, won't you go and please call that divine Krishna? He's the one who plays the flute, wears the peacock feather. 
He's the one who slew that demon, that terrible demon with the long hair. I have long hair. He has also slain me. Please go and bring him to me. My heart is filled with love. And then the God of love has a five flower tipped arrow. And he is like that God of love. There is a banner of love that flies. And please go and bring that one to me. So there is this opening speaking to her. Then there's just this one line that repeats. And when we do the dance, instead of, um, instead of like Mickey Mouse, like you just, here's the line, I'm here, I'm going to the forest to meet. It's like you have the line, and then each time the line repeats, the artist, the dancer, gets to weave her own variations into the story so it becomes more enriched, and it can repeat, and it can repeat. So this is just a little line uh, uh, from one song to give you this example. dance, and I think the timer went backwards, um, is a very small piece written by Balamurli Krishna. And what I like about this is that it's not just describing the deity, but it's actually also becoming it. And this is something that uh, I use at an end of a performance. There's a pure dance piece, very fast, a lot of energy, and then it ends with this little bit of poetry. And basically it says, Om Kara Karani, she who is the form of Om, who um, is the one who is the female energy of the universe, take my egotism, take my vanity and dispel it. And then as the form of Durga, the tantric syllable is enough to 
frighten the demons. And so that sound fills the universe, removes evil. And then the sweet sound of Morley, which is honey, the sound of Krishna, and the name of the poet, Balamurli Krishna. The sound of Morley fills the universe as the beloved of the three worlds is, um, is the one who gives compassion, is graceful, and I ask for her blessings. Om Kara Karani. Om Kara Karani. Ah!